All right, hello, everyone. So I'm Trace Kershaw. I'm a professor and chair of the Social and Behavioral Sciences Department within the Yale School of Public Health. Today I'm going to talk a little bit of uh, my, my talk called Sex, Drugs, and Mobile Phones. And uh, so cell phones now is like having a child. It's like I sleep with my phone, being the charger right there next to the bed. So this shows kind of the pervasiveness of cell phones within individuals' lives and how important they are um, to kind of the day-to-day -day functioning of individuals. But despite that, public health and I think health research in general remains woefully behind uh, other fields in terms of our use of public health. So I kind of added this slide. Uh, I used to not have this in this talk, but then whenever I give this talk, I get like two reactions, like half the people are like, yeah, that's pretty cool. And then the other half are like, are like, uh, are shocked and dismayed and think I'm just like the creepiest person in the world and you'll find out why <laughs> in a little bit. But, uh, so this is my justification slide early on. And so the idea is public health, we're probably 20 or 30 years behind other fields in terms of our use of technology to improve health. And so the analogy I came up with, how many people are familiar with this game? So this is called Pong, right? So and the object is, is, you know, when one person hits the little ball and tries to get it past this person. And so as you can see, this is fairly basic, you know? Uh, but, uh, but level two, though, level two, I'm serious. It's pretty much the same as this one. But this is essentially what public health is. I mean, so we'll do, you know, I think we're advancing a little bit, but it's like text message interventions or, or, or at the very, like, uh, avant-garde, the most avant-garde would be like de uh, developing an app. Well, congratulations, public health. You and my 13-year-old niece can develop apps. <laughs> so I think we have to think about, and if we compare that to other fields, if we compare that to, like, marketing, to economics, to, of course, to IT, this is them. And so, <laughs> if you look at, you know, of course, <laughs> companies like Amazon or Google or Facebook, they use <coughs> every single piece of information that one has to, to develop complex algorithms to understand people's behavior. You know, so Google, I, and I'm sure now most people know this, like every email you sent, Google looks at, I mean, they don't like one person look at it, but they have algorithms that look at that data. Every search that you do, everything you do within a Google platform phone. Uh, same thing with Facebook, same thing with Amazon. They're using every piece of information, and usually they're building very complex pro profiles, mostly with the goal of selling you something, and often the goal of selling you something that's, that's against public health interests. So the idea is, and you know, people are now starting to get worried about Google and about all of these, like, you know, what information they're potentially using, but we can also think about as not only potentially slowing them down, but a ways for us to catch up. Because if we don't catch up, we are going to lose. Yeah, and so the, the, the example I always give is, you know, I started, I was on Facebook and I started getting all of these banner ads for uh, mattresses. And like, I never, you know, searched anything about like wanting to buy a mattress, or I never said anything about like, like even in tech, like I'm having trouble sleeping. Uh, uh, and my back had been hurting a little bit, and essentially, Facebook knew I needed a new mattress. <laughs> so I needed a new mattress. And, um, and I got the mattress, by the way, fast. Let's go. <laughs> Great, thanks for asking. But, um, <laughs> The idea is that they actually are doing better, I mean, they're doing, and they're actually doing better public health work than we are, in, 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 to be honest. So I don't know if you know, but Facebook actually has an algorithm where they can detect individuals who are potentially suicidal. And they actually have on staff uh, medical health professionals who then would intervene if they think that they hit the certain algorithm thing, and they actually do counseling with individuals within that meet this algorithm that they're potentially suicidal. So there, Facebook is doing better public health work than public health researchers are. And the way they do it is, again, they have these complex algorithms that it's nothing obvious, it's nothing they type, but it's like, how, like a change in patterns of posting of information. 
the types of language one uses. And they have these ways to actually detect using kind of machine learning and other complex uh, technological tools to, uh, to, to, to detect, detect these things. And I think we, as public health practitioners, need to advance, because if not, you know, we're kind of stuck. I mean, there is something kind of like, you know, nicely hypnotic about this. But, uh, but still, it's fairly, uh, you know, it's fairly basic, you know, so do we want to kind of just hit the little ball back and forth, uh, or do we want to slay dragons? It's my, it's my starting point of trying to get you guys energized for, uh, for what I'll show you in about five slides. All right, um, so this is just kind of the, uh, the outline for the talk. Of course, it has to be in a phone form, so I'll give you a little bit of background. Uh, talk to you about the methods. And then I'm going to, this is going to be more kind of a, 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 an idea of what can be done using kind of cell phone technology. And so I'm going to give you three uh, or four mini uh, studies showing each of these things. And so I'll talk a little bit about a study looking at misogynistic images and sexual risk. I'll talk a, about a study using texting and uh, linking texting behavior and substance use. And then a study looking at social media behavior, emotions, and stress. And then a study looking at location using GPS coordinates and risk behavior. And then I'll talk a little bit about future studies. And then I'll probably go to the cards afterwards because I have a food thing. Um, <laughs> all right, so, uh, so just a little trigger warning. This, is about, this study is about sex and drugs. And so there are going to be you know, language images that are, that are uh, kind of adult in nature, so just kind of to have that idea. This is a study about sex and drugs among young men. So some of the images and, and, and language is gonna be um, a little bit adult. So just general background. So the, even though we're gonna be focusing on methods, the study I'm gonna talk about is a study on the risk of emerging adult men. And so this is, by emerging adult, we mean uh, ages 18 to 29. And so why focus on the, that age? Well, that's a time of transition for young men. So this is when young men uh, go from uh, living with their parents, potentially, to living alone. A lot of them start engaging in risk behavior, whether that's sex, drugs, and alcohol. This is the age risk where actually they are at the highest level of risk in terms of sex and drug uh, alcohol risk. And this is also, uh, if you uh, look at any age group and gender group in terms of the group that is most influenced by their peers, and you think about peer pressure, and you think about little kids, but actually the group most influenced by their peers are 18, 25 year old men. And again, that's not that surprising if you go to like YouTube and like just search like, you know, people doing something dumb, it's usually, <laughs> 18 to 25 year old men, it's usually because one of their friends like dared them to do it. And so this idea that this is an age group that's heavily influenced by, by peers and then this relates to kind of what we're gonna look at is the influence of social networks and behavior change. So the, uh, the, the idea of social networks and behavior change is that behaviors can change through social networks or can spread through social networks much like disease or viruses can spread through social networks. So if then an individual starts, let's say, using marijuana, the idea is that actual behavior can spread and, and influence uh, their friend's use of marijuana, and that can such spread, et cetera, et cetera. But, so that's the negative. The positive, though, from a, from a behavior change standpoint is knowing that this gives actually interventions actually a leg up. So if we know that that's the case, then we could potentially intervene with this person. Instead of the traditional way we might handle mar mar like drug use, we would have to actually get all of these people into some kind of treatments of treatment or interventions to deal with it. But from a network standpoint, what this would suggest is if we intervene with this person, that positive influence change might spread just like the same way that that behavior can spread and then that could potentially influence uh, everybody within the, the network. So the idea from a network intervention standpoint is if we find key people in the network and intervene with them, that, that can actually have a, a, a long lasting and spread effect within the context of the network. So network influence has both positive and negative effects. 
but we can then think about the best way to use it positively. So then if we add technology into this element, technology now, nowadays, technology really uh, broadens how we think about networks, because not only, uh, um, not only do we connect with each other face to face, but now more and more we are connecting each other virtually, whether that's text messaging, whether that's on social media outlets like Facebook, Snapchat, et cetera. And so now more and, and not only that, we can know, you know, I not only know or can contact any friend at any time, but I can, I know usually where they are. Uh, I, cause they either post it or tell me where they are virtually. So I can like track and understand kind of where friends are at any time point. So that gives kind of the potential level of influence of networks, particularly within the context of technology. It makes it even more relevant for public health. So, and similarly, with all the data that's available, we can do like, you know, there's no reason we can't do like Google and, and Amazon and stuff and use this information uh, to, to develop complex behavioral profiles of individuals. And so knowing th those behavioral profiles, bless you, and the flow of information or how people connect with each other using kind of this data from, from, from technology, we can have a really thorough and complex understanding of individuals and how behavior is changed and how individuals influence each other. Um, within a network. Uh, oh, by the way, I didn't say this. I don't know what your guys' policy is, but like, if you haven't guessed, I don't really have a flow. So you can, uh, you can interrupt me and ask questions at any time. You don't have to wait to a standard after question answer period. Um, all right, so that is the general idea is that we can create this, these kind of complex profiles and understand. And so this is like, so I think, uh, are people aware of the concept of big data? So big data is this idea where you like you you look at like data from and, and often when it's done when you look at technologies they look at like Twitter feeds and they look at all. So this is what I like to call or I'm deeming uh, little big data or big little data. I haven't I haven't decided. Maybe I'll workshop it with you guys. But uh, trademark work, both of them trademark trade <laughs> But um, <laughs> but it's the idea is is each person has big data, right? So what we usually don't get with big data is we don't tie it within individual responses. But with, <laughs> if you look at kind of cell phone data information, you're able to take all the information that a person has and still do interviews and still tie it to their specific behaviors or outcomes. So we have this, the power of big data, but also still the, the, the individualistic tailoring of individual data, hence little big data or big little data. But so that is essentially what we're trying to do, is we're taking all the data available within a single, single individual and still tying it to their individual behavior. That's what Google does. That's what Amazon does. They take all the things you do and then they tie it to your buying behavior and they develop even more complex algorithms. All right. And so similarly, like I said, we have the profile and then we have how they connect, how they talk to each other, what they actually potentially say. You know, and we have this idea of how information flows within networks and kind of the overall profiles of those networks. And so that's kind of the basic logic of this. And so just to see how this is operationalized, I'll kind of tell you the overall methods and then we'll go over some examples of how we can use this information. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so we can harness that. So whether we're using their actual API or not is a, is a different issue. And nowadays, you know, like every time Facebook does something, I'm like, oh, man, you're really screwing my stuff up. But, uh, but nowadays, it's probably even harder. But there are ways where you can access social media accounts. Uh, like, like that's the beauty of individual or little big data is I, can just, I have the person here. And I said, hey, can I, look at, can I, can I have access to your profile? and your posts, and they say sure, and I can access their profile and their posts. So it's, it, it, whereas if I was just using big data and I was trying to access it, then I would have to partner with Facebook. And nowadays, I'm, Facebook would probably be more reticent to partner with me than they would have five years ago, uh, where they did partner with academics. Uh, but probably now it would be harder. So, but doing it little, I can get feeds from the individuals themselves. Yeah. So when looking at, um, there's, when looking at 
there's the public posting and then there's the DMs, the messages, mm -hmm. and all that other stuff. Yep. So, you know, a 23-year-old man who has sex with, man who has sex with man who, let's say, lives in rural Kansas, his Facebook posts and his Facebook messages or his use of Snapchat and his use of Facebook are gonna be entirely different. So how much trouble do, you have to, do, do we have to extract the different kind of posts given, you know, say, privacy concerns, especially when it's messages compared yep. to posting? So we'll get to that in a second. Because uh, we did we did both, and we'll talk about the privacy ethics issue in a second. But yeah, uh, and we'll show some comparisons too by Facebook and texting. Um, all right, other questions? Yeah. So in the uh, social networks behavioral change slide, you mentioned impacting one or doing interventions with one specific key person in that social network, and they can spread their influence to other members, but Theoretically, there could be a counter sort of influence from that person's networks to uh, you know, influence a relapse or some sort of um, opposite behavioral change. So what are some of the ways to minimize that impact? Right. So one, I mean, some of it is uh, identifying the individuals, the potential influencers within the network, and it might be more than one person, right? So it might be a couple people, and if you think that one person is a potential uh, a, a, a counteracting influence than intervening with both of them potentially. So some of it is, you know, developing these profiles to identify the best people to potentially intervene with is, is the first strategy. And for some networks that are really, not to get too network nerdy here for you, decentralized, meaning that there isn't like a leadership or main influencer, it might be the most effective to intervene with lots of people. So not every network you can intervene with one person, but some are going to be effective and some aren't. So understanding the, complex, uh, the composition of the network and the potential influencers are the strategy to do that. And the more information we can process and the quicker we can process it, the more we can make those decisions quickly. So that's why we can use technology and more complex like machine learning techniques to identify those influencers faster than most academics do. You know, we can't wait our three years to process the information and then, you know, put it up for publication and then decide. We have to make those decisions quicker. And so using more uh, compl complicated computational technologic techniques is one of the strategies to do that. All right. So, um, so then getting into the samples. So this is a study we called the CRUISE study. It's a cell phone research to enhance well-being. And um, it was 119 emerging adult men from New Haven. Uh, so what we did is, it, it's got a little blocky, it's not meant to look like an Atari uh, character, but uh, so we, we, we basically uh, enrolled an individual, they, we asked them about their friends. We didn't have, they didn't have to be three friends, it could be as many friends as they, they, they uh, had, and then essentially we asked them about their network, and then we went out and tried to recruit their network. So we, we didn't get everybody, but I'll show you it. And then we did the same for these three people. So this isn't an RDA uh, for people who know kind of respondent-driven sampling. This isn't respondent-driven sampling. This is what's called network sampling, which basically I ask this, the entire network of this person, and then I go out and try to get the entire network of this person. Uh, and so uh, and I do that for everybody, whereas RDS, you only have three, and it's this idea of seeds. So this is more of a true network sample strategy. And we did that, and we ended up getting about 12 networks, a 60% overall recruitment rate, uh, meaning 60% of all the people listed we got. But 72% of those that we could actually contact, some people we could never, we couldn't even find, or the friends didn't even have their numbers. And so of the people we could actually, actually get a hold of and contact, we got 72%. Yeah. I don't understand. Yes, yeah, so we essentially had 12 original, like 12 people that were asked, kind of. So we did, did uh, time location sampling strategies where we, knew, where we did some strategy, like we knew areas, we did some ethnography to see where adult men hang out, and then we went to those places, and then we approached people. And those were kind of our seeds, our starts. And so, uh, you know, we started iteratively. We would do one, and then we would build it try to see how many people, you know, basically try to fill that network until it ended or reached saturation, and then we do another person. 
So like once this network, let's say, reached saturation, we, we went to a new person. Reached saturation, went to a new person. So, and, and then by the time we got to 12, we reached our, our total sample that we needed is 120. So we could have kept on going. So often, like uh, for those of you, again, who know networks, sometimes you do geographic bounds. But we wanted real friend networks because what we'll be doing in a second, we needed that. So we weren't doing a geographic bounded network. We were trying to get friend networks and how many, ever many friend networks equal to 120 people is what, what we needed in advance. All right. So we did uh, three uh, interviews, baseline three months and six months. And then we basically did a network, uh, a classic network assessment where we would ask people who their uh, close friends or people they hang out with are. And then we did a series of interviews where we had sexual risk, substance use, mental health, and psychosocial outcomes. And we essentially did this at three time points. So you're saying, wow, this is no different than any other study. Where is the, the cool stuff? Well then, uh, and we got overall 88% retention at the end of six months, which actually is fairly good, particularly given what we did next. So then, essentially what we did then is we had their phone and we put software in their phone that allowed us to basically track everything on their phone. So we could track <laughs> their text messages, their phone, uh, their text messages, actual the messages and, and the actual content of their messages, their phone calls, not their uh, actual what they talked with, but when they called somebody and who they called, because uh, that's illegal to, to, to listen, to, but you can look at text messages. Uh, and uh, GPS coordinates every 30 minutes for, uh, for, for the entire duration. And we did this essentially for, and then also other social media, other Twitter, other Facebook, and other Instagram posts. And then we did this essentially all the way for six months. Yeah. Could you also capture? Messaging. And Facebook video messaging and what that calls, or was it, um, could you capture all, all of the kind of? So theoretically, we could have at this point that we didn't at this point. We're kind of like, you know, this is already is like we call it edge pushing. Okay. And so we are a little baby stepping here. Okay. So there are things we could have done. Uh, there are more uh, advanced techniques where you could do that, you could look at every app that people use and how long, and you, then you could have looked at like the instant messaging or the, the what app, uh, Facebook uh, messaging, but we didn't at this time. Uh, other questions? Yeah. So this is was the one we use is commercially available, but uh, the, like the other, the new ones we'll use will be uh, like there are there's code out there for all of this that is uh, standard code that one can modify for their uses. Uh, I mean the tracking stuff it gets complicated because there is some legalness here to it, uh, and so we'll talk. We can I can talk about it in a second. But so the one thing that made it so Connecticut, if you know, is a two-party state. So uh, um, one, the text messages at the time was a little bit gray, but even regardless, we only took information from people in the study. That's one of the reasons we did whole networks. So it's like, if, I, if there are six people in the networks in the study, I'm in this network, but I wasn't in the study, we weren't looking at their text messages. So it, it, we only were looking at messages or, or collecting messages for people that have agreed or consented to be collecting messages. So, so that was one strategy, and that's another thing you could do. The other thing you could do, and what we will do in uh, probably subsequent studies, is only look, you could, you know, depending on how you build, you can only look one way as well. You can only look at a message somebody sent, and if they're in the study, you just don't, you don't take any reception messages. And some of the models that we're building, it's as predictive, I think, if you just looked at one way than if you looked at both. It's a little bit less interesting. The story is not as cool, but it's, but it is, uh, probably from a predictive standpoint, it's probably just as predictive looking at just one way. Uh, and then there are a bunch of st states that are one party states, but that's a different issue. Yeah. How much did you pay for your phone? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think we paid them $200 total for the six months. Uh, you know, so again, you have to balance what's not, given the, the level of intrusiveness here, you have to balance. Uh, what is um, potentially uh, too much money to be 
coercive and then what's enough to be to actually give them time. And again, I mean, this again, I think there is a generational thing here. So like, like our guys weren't like that put off by this. I mean, we had a 70% acceptance rates of people that we talked to. And most of them were like, yeah, whatever. I mean, it's like, you know. Uh, <laughs> And I think we did a very good job building trust, why we're going to use this data, how we're going to use this data, how this data is protected. Because there's a lot of things about like, you know, what happens if somebody admits a crime on some of this data. What happens if they're, you know, so we are, a, one, a non-disclosing entity. We do not have to uh, disclose any crime, and we tell them that we do not. The only thing we would have to disclose if somebody uh, texted something that, that uh, put somebody at uh, imme immediate and knowable risk, meaning they would have to say, I am going to go you know, hurt Trace. If they said, I'm going to hurt Trace, that's not reportable. If they said, I'm going to hurt Trace tomorrow at 3 o'clock on the corner of College and Crown, that is reportable. And nobody does that, obviously. Uh, so, uh, and so um, that's it. And we just make that very clear to them that that's what we're doing. And so, uh, but anything talk about drug use, as you'll see, is not a reportable, and we went, and not only do we uh, would we not report that, but um, we have a certificate of confidentiality, meaning if it's actually they're more protected being with us, and they like they they can get the information from their phone company probably a lot easier than they could get it from us, given the, the amount of amount of uh, protections we have within the context of uh, of the certificate of confidentiality and the other issues around the IRB. Here, yeah, did I say something? Yeah. I'm trying to figure out what is the advantage of using this approach versus using something as generic as like, um, IBM Watson Analytics where you're looking at just social media flow in general versus using this approach. What, what, are, what specific question are you trying to answer? Yeah, so I mean essentially what it gives us, it gives us, it will give us more information than the, the IBM Watson because essentially we have everything that they potentially do. So it gives the idea of flow or connection within a network, which Watson wouldn't do. It gives us information of how individuals kind of communicate and influence each other in a network. I'll give you some specific examples here. But there's going to be some overlap, but, it's, uh, but by being so specific to individuals and then being able to tie to individual responses and outcomes, it just gives us better predictive tools than something like IBM Watson would do. Um, yeah. Yep, so like, you know, like that's one of the big comments we get is like the Hawthorne effect of this, meaning so are people changing their response based on uh, being observed? And the answer is so we did some assessments, you know, where we basically would do like a, a debriefing session afterwards. So what we could have done and what we're doing in subsequent studies is you can look at, pr like, you can download, we could have downloaded information prior to being in the study and then after, and then look to see change. We didn't do that in this study. But we did debrief, and most of them, like their reaction led us to believe that they did not change their behavior. Again, whether uh, uh, when we get into sp some specific examples, you might be skeptical. But because uh, a lot of the responses were like, oh, yeah, I totally forgot you were doing this. <laughs> like, you mean, meaning it's like once you're, uh, like the other thing we could do and we haven't done yet is look at the first couple weeks and then subsequent because it is true, once you get used to being observed, it might not be, it's hard to always remember not to text. And given the level of information that we got or what people did say via this information, uh, you know, if they were hiding it from us, it, it would mean like even we're underestimating some of these estimates and, they, and as you'll see, they're actually relatively, people were not shy about talking about drug, sex, and other things on these, on these formats. So, it's possible that there was some Hawthorne, but at least from our debriefing and our qualitative interviews, it didn't seem like that was that that happened often. But I think subsequently we can look at kind of change by looking at pre stuff and post stuff. Other questions? All right. So we ended up 122,000 GPS coordinates this is over six months, 18,000 phone calls, 29,000 texts, 38,000 Facebook uh, uh, tweets. 
35,000 Facebook posts and 2,526 Instagram uh, images. The reason the Instagram images were the least is because we actually we only collected a small window because this is back before we had, uh, and even the machine learning now for images is a little spotty. We actually hand coded all these, so we weren't going to do a lot of them. And for privacy, we didn't store them, so we had to hand code them in suto or like in real time. Uh, and so we had to limit ourselves in terms of what we could actually code realistically. Um, but these were actually so much, I even, usually I would be like, I'm not going to hang it. But I, I coded a lot of the images myself just because there was so much fun. You really learned about somebody by looking at their, their Instagram stuff. So. Um, all right, so the overall demographics, the average age is around 20 years old. Income is about $10,000 a year. Uh, so very, uh, so low income, but still uh, everybody had, 95% uh, uh, had, had um, cell phones and smartphones, actually. Uh, um, the majority were uh, black or Hispanic. In terms of social media use, so this is kind of typical what you see in the uh, usual Pew Internet survey, 75% on Facebook, 38% on Twitter, and about 50% on Instagram. Um, and as we'll see in the Instagram, this is back in the day before Facebook. Uh, you know, this is five years ago, and I think Facebook had not bought Instagram yet. And Instagram was a little bit more wild, wild west than it is now. It's a little bit more cleaned up. But as I won't show all the, the images, but the, there's some really like stuff that could not be on Instagram now than it was when we were in the study. Um, and then just to give you an idea of overall risk of this populate of this sample, uh, around 80% uh, had used alcohol in the past uh, uh, 30 days. About 60% binge drank in the past 30 days, about 65% uh, used drugs. Uh, the majority of this was marijuana use. This is, our sample was a, a, mar a heavy marijuana using pop uh, a sample, but not really, not that many hard drugs. It was like about 5% were hair, uh, opioids or, or uh, stimulants. The majority was, was marijuana. And 42% and uh, used pot at least uh, w uh, more than one time a day. Right. So just to start going over kind of exact what we can actually do with this, you know, I'm just going to go four studies, kind of showing you kind of this type of inf the type of questions we could ask, and for four different papers that we're working on. And one we looked at does posting sexual and misogynistic uh, uh, images and objectifying images of women relate to sexual risk of these young men. And so we took these 2,569 images from Instagram and Twitter from 67 uh, of the guys who actually were on Instagram or Twitter. The average was about six photos per week. And then we hand coded these. So we did four coders, 92% agreement, which is fairly good agreement. And we assessed the prevalence of images that had sex in them, images that had misogynistic images to them, and images that had any objectification of women. To them, yeah. Given that you know, like 81% of your sample was black and other, like, almost majority were black or brown, what's, I'm curious on what the race of your coders and cultural congruence of, of your methods. Good question. So it was, uh, we had uh, three of the four coders were uh, coders of color. Um, You mean for our, our uh, population? I, I don't. I mean, uh, I don't think we can, from an EOC standpoint, hire based on race. But no, code uh, like recruit based on the class of coders that make up. For the, for oh, you mean uh, so the places within New Haven that we were we were recruiting based on STI rates of places within New Haven, uh, and so given where we were recruiting from. That distri the the racial distribution is is similar to the uh, racial distribution of the areas to which we were recruiting. But the study itself didn't have an exclusion or inclusionary uh, criteria uh, that was based on race. And the gender of the coders? Gender of the coders, we had uh, two women and two men. How racially integrated were the social networks uh, of the 12 networks? 
That's a good question. I do not know the answer offhand, to be honest. I don't think we've looked at that, actually. Uh, I mean, given that there's the variability of, of race is not that big in the sample in general, uh, my guess is going to be high, but I, we haven't looked at that. But that's a good, that's a good thing to look at, yeah. Uh, other questions? All right, so just to give you two examples again, this is where we'll trigger warning a little bit here. So here's two examples. Uh, one is, uh, this is, we coded this for sex. Uh, and then we coded this uh, for uh, uh, misogynistic images. So these are just two examples. And the reason actually I could show both of these, because I said it before, is because we were able to actually keep any memes, or as I called until uh, the people, uh, our Aries corrected me, memes. They're not memes. <laughs> 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 So uh, we can keep any of the memes, but we, um, and so then this is what we coded these, these, uh, these images. And so what we found was uh, in terms of um, prevalence of pictures that had sex misogyny or objectification, what you can see is the blue is the pictures, the red is the participants. And you know, from a picture level, and we'll get to the same when we get to the text, like this isn't that prevalent. I mean, because let, let's face it, like 90% of pictures are selfies or pictures of food. So it's like, you know, uh, so the rest of it, it isn't from a picture standpoint, only about five, you know, about 7% had sex, about 3% had misogyny, and about 2.5% had <coughs> objectification, bless you, of women. But from a participant standpoint, meaning the percentage of participants that had at least one image of these, it's fairly high. 45% of the men in the sample had an image of sex. Um, you know, 33% had an image that was misogynistic, and about 25% had an image that was an objectification of women. So, you know, from a prevalence standpoint, from a person standpoint, it's pretty high. And then when we looked at uh, no sexual images versus sexual images, so the blue and the red, and no misogynistic or objectification images versus misogynistic or objectification images, we see some effects here so that those that did not have sexual images uh, had more condom use than individuals that did have sexual images and the same goes for those that did not have uh, misogynistic images had more condom use than those that did. And similarly, when we look at concurrency, which meaning having more than one partner over a given time period, we see similar effects with those that with sexual and misogynistic images having uh, more likely to have concurrency in partners than those without sexual and misogynistic images. Yeah? Was concurrency self-reported? Self-reported, yes. All the, uh, uh, sec the outcomes were self-reported. Yeah? Did you control for men that had sex with women? Uh, did I, we control for, oh, who, so this, these, uh, this is all, this is across all partners, but the majority uh, one of the criteria actually were that uh, individuals had to have sex with women in the past six months. So these are majority uh, uh, self-identified heterosexual. Other questions? So this is kind of an example with the, the Instagram. And then next uh, we'll go into uh, our use of the text messaging. And so this is, does communicating about substances and texts relate to problem alcohol and drug use? So this is, we looked at the text messaging among individuals within the networks. So we had the 29,216 texts from 119 participants. And we did what's called network text analysis, which essentially is a machine learning technique that allows you to detect themes of alcohol and substance use. And so what you can do is you build a lexicon of ways individuals talk about substance use, and then you put that in the machine learning technique, and it builds on that lexicon, and then it helps you identify all the instances to which there is a discussion of substance use within these text messages. Because obviously, we're not going to hand code 29,206 text messages. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we did like a training sample, and then we would develop. And then once you develop a core lexicon, then you just then it does it iteratively. The 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 the, the uh, algorithm just does it iteratively, and it will update it, and then it gives you a final version. And then you can go through 
as we'll see, and ha do some hand coding if you want to understand the context of, of, of those codes. So then once I have my lexicon, I can then just go, give me all the, uh, the text that has alcohol or substance use in it. And then that ends up being less, and I can hand code that if I wanted to hand code that, yeah. Did you have, um, I think I saw something like this in Philadelphia, do you have members from the community of your investigation helped validate and hand code some of, um, at least some of the text, some of the text, some of the lexicon and building? Yeah, so we would, uh, you know, we would have, uh, we did some piloting where we would look at kind of what the main lexicon is and, and they potentially add it. So, even before we developed the lexicon, we didn't develop the lexicon all from the training sample. We had a base lexicon that we did from kind of qualitative focus group interviews, and then we added to that. Yeah. Was the lexicon bilingual? Like, did it include English? So this is not. So this is all. Uh, this was all. Uh, we did have some Spanish, uh, but the Spanish. Yeah, I have to remember how we handled the Spanish. Uh, I think we translated. Uh, I think we translated all the Spanish texts and then put it through the lexicon. Probably not the best approach. We probably should have had a bilingual lexicon, but but I think we translated and then put it through. But next time, uh, I think in pr future studies we would think about having a more bilingual lexicon. Yeah. So um, I'm still kind of stuck in the previous part. Sure. So we'll get to, uh, get to both of those. I don't know, we'll get to totally like I'd always identifying the most influential because some of it's going to depend on the context. So, uh, but I'll get to the neighborhood part later. Um, but that's something we could do. We could try to identify, but I don't think we've fully done uh, an analysis looking at the influence because it might depend. We've done some network stuff, which we'll show in a second, but it's not. It's less looking at a single influencers and more the overall influence of the network. Um, all right. Yeah. Uh, was this before emojis became? So popular? yeah. So this is no emojis was still. Oh well, I would say it's like we'll say mid emoji use. Uh, um, but at this point, this program that we used at this time did not. Capture emojis, future programs that we're using do because one of my, my goal in life is to have like a paper which is just like, you know, emo, you know, it's like, you know, rainbow, uh, goblin, happy, smiley face, colon, you know, the influence of like, like, yeah, so that's the goal of life. Uh, so yeah, eventually we'll, we'll get, we'll get there. But, uh, but, but now most of these techniques, these machine learnings can handle emojis. Uh, and so, uh, so the, the the new ones we would try, we would make sure that we could we could get in. Because right now it's like even texts probably don't make much sense without some kind of emojis or bitmojis or what. Like I literally only communicate in bitmoji, uh, and um, and my bitmojis they're fire. But um, uh, yeah, so I think uh, but so I think we have to figure out how to handle that. Bitmoji is probably more complicated. Uh, em uh, yeah, but uh, emojis are pretty standard. All right. So this is, you know, the very scientific word cloud, just to give you an idea of uh, kind of what the most common words are that was used in our lexicon. And so as you can kind of say that I, the C that I, I had already talked about, our sample was mostly a marijuana smoking sample. So you see a lot of weed smoking, smoke, you know, and then a little bit of drinking. Uh, and my favorite of the strawberries, uh, and so this is just basically kind of how the, how uh, they uh, individuals in the sample talked about uh, substance use. And again, just to give you an idea about, uh, and this again is at the participant level. Again, if we talked at the actual text level, the prevalence would be very very low because again, most of the uh, you know, these 18, 29 year old uh, guys, most of their texts were like, hey. And, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, 
but you know the ones that were about 50, about 30 percent, you know, sent and received uh, alcohol. About almost 40 percent sent and received uh, ones about drugs and either alcohol or marijuana. You know, almost 50 percent either sent or received a text about uh, alcohol or, or drugs. And so this is our networks. Uh, and so the ties here are uh, texts. So these are people connected that text each other. And if you see the light blue means they have, so we used uh, the audit and the DAST. So, you know, to measure both problematic alcohol use and problematic marijuana or problematic drug use. And then those, you're using the critical cutoffs of relativism, we categorize them as having no problematic substance use problematic alcohol use, problematic drug use, or problematic both. And as you can see here, I don't know, what do you guys see here? Do you see anything? What, 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 what can we kind of see that's happening? Drinkers tend to be better. Right, so the, so the drinkers and the non-drinkers, there seems to be a clustering by, by use here, right? So here's all our non-drink, like a lot of non-drinkers, and they're all pretty much clustered in the people within this network that aren't that our drinkers or substance users are kind of on the periphery of the network, if you notice, right? And similarly, the, the, the drinkers and the, uh, you know, the, the multi-users are all kind of clustered together as well. So there is some obvious link of that those that are, that have these, these uh, who tend to use drugs or not use drugs tend to be linked together. So then we took it to the next level and looked at, you know, using as our ties texts that mentioned either alcohol or drug use. And what we found was if, I mean, this again doesn't seem surprising, the thickness here is the amount they actually talked about it. And so that those that texted about uh, drug use were more likely to be problematic drug users. I mean, it's not too surprising. So more texts with marijuana related to con uh, content related to positive attitudes toward marijuana use, more frequent marijuana use, and problematic marijuana use. So this is a way we could actually, you know, look at, you know, behavior in a way that's fairly, you know, it's, it's both obtrusive and unobtrusive at the same time, right? Because obtrusive because we're monitoring their text messages, but it's unobtrusive because they don't have to give us any information. I mean, they're, we're basically monitoring their behavior in kind of real time. You know, what I'm calling, I'm, I'm dubbing a lot of things uh, lately, I, like, I call it technologic ethnography. So we're essentially watching them in a way that is kind of not, they don't have to sit down and spend two hours giving us an interview. We're seeing their kind of behaviors and able to take that and model their behaviors to actual then, actual substance use later. And the other thing we should show here is that, and this is kind of interesting, those with problem marijuana use had, had significantly lower what's called betweenness centrality. And what that means, that's a network term, which means that they tend to be on the periphery of the network. Uh, and, and the opposite, I don't show it here, but the opposite was found for alcohol use. Those with more problem alcohol use tended to be more central in the network or more connected. Uh, and the reason, I mean, it kind of makes sense, like, you know, especially for 18 to 29 year olds, if you're drinking, usually you're going to go out. To go out, usually you have to connect with individuals. But if you're going to just, like, smoke marijuana, you can literally just stay at home, you know, you know, watch anime, play video games, and you're pretty much happy, you know, right? So you don't need to connect potentially as much as other people would, right? Uh, and then the other, no, so that next level, so this is pretty, I think pretty cool, you know, but uh, the next level is now we can not only know this, so this you could get from regular network data if I was just gonna ask people like, you know, who they hang out with and whether they smoke marijuana with that person, I could get this. But what, the, what this data, the phone data can give us is now we can look and look at the context for everybody that talked about marijuana use, I can actually go to the text and understand the context of how this influence might happen. How this person might be influencing this person uh, to use or not use marijuana. And so I'll just give you a couple examples. Uh, so this is an example you know, from a behavior change point of what we call direct influence. So uh, 
this guy, so these guys are the cutest. They only talked, or they always talked in old English to each other. So it was like, you know, sense, sense and sensibility meets Cheech and Chong, you know? So they were like, I'm chilling at home, da, thou wanted to get clouded, which means you want to smoke marijuana. And the guy's like, no, and, you know, sure. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no idea what that means. We're, we're going to do it in my house. No parents around. So pick the man up. I'm, I'm at grandma's house. So, <laughs> so basically, the, you know, the green guy's just, you know, playing, hanging with grandma, playing canasta, you know, and, <laughs> and then this guy directly influences them. So would, would he have smoked marijuana if it wasn't for this initiation? So we can see kind of how influence happens potentially within the context of, of this relationship, right? So this gives us information that would be almost impossible to get with traditional data collection techniques. And I'll skip the information influence one, but then my favorite, this is the one that always comes up that could either be determined as, as somebody, uh, like the, ha the reason you are suspect like a Hawthorne effect, but I believe in my heart of hearts this is real. So this is my favorite, this shows a positive effect. So, so we'll look at again, we definitely need to smoke. These are two different people. We need to definitely smoke after this party. I need to smoke this away. What happened? Everybody bothering me. My mom pissed me off, SMH, which means shake my head. You will be straight, bro. Don't abuse the cannabis to help regulate your feelings. Oh my, my heart, heart eye emoji. That's how you become dependent on it. Mom might be annoying you right now, but it's help, it'll help push you in, it's only to help push you in gear. So this is an example of somebody who's offering social support, right, to, to reduce the potential negative effect, you know, of, uh, of using, using drugs. So, so again, this is, uh, this is a positive example of positive influence, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, the idea is, right, could we build models to help us do that? I don't think we would want to do it like in an individualistic standpoint, but if you could, can you build predictive models that would help you uh, help you understand, I wouldn't say predict, yeah, predict behavior or understand potential risks or triggers of risk that one could then do influence or interventions to reduce that, those triggers. Yeah. Do you know which of the, you know, two slides ago there was the kind of networks, do you know which node that was? Like I saw there was the five orange and the one blue guy in like, um, did you, do you know which note? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I don't, yeah, I, mean, I won't tell you, but yes, I, I mean, we can identify this to a specific person. Yes, I mean, we have that link. So that gives us an, I mean, we're gonna look at it more broadly to understand kind of general processes instead of understanding that one specific person, but yeah. Question, all right. So then similarly, but just a different showing, uh, do positive and negative emotions in social media relate to substance use, and does the relationship between social media emotions and substance use differ between those experiencing low and high stress? So we did a similar technique where this time we analyzed both text and face Facebook posts, and we used uh, LIWC, the Linguistic Inquiry Word Count. I don't know if those people know, know that, but that's uh, Penny Baker's work uh, at U Texas Austin, he essentially has developed his own lexicon with a, spe with a special focus in emotion words. So he's basically uh, classified millions of words into different types of emotions. Uh, and so it's another machine learning technique, but he has this semantic dictionary of 6,400 words, including actual uh, uh, network lingo, he calls it, which means like text message lingo. So even if they're using shorthand text message lingo, they're still able to, to, to uh, translate that into these kind of emotion words. And then we looked at, so, you know, does how people communicate both on Facebook and text message influence their subsequent substance use severity? So is it, you know, the idea of Penny Baker's ideas, uh, for those of you guys who know, Penny Baker is the idea is how we talk, whether how, you know, whether we're negative or positively emotion people in terms of how we talk actually relates to subsequent uh, both mental health and substance use behavior. And so we kind of wanted to test that uh, and look to see whether Facebook or text messaging was more influential. The idea kind of that you brought up that was if Facebook is uh, private, we might be, might be 
painting ourselves in a different light. Or sorry, Facebook is public, where you might be painting ourselves in a different light than we would in the text messages, which is more private, right? Only one person is seeing this. Facebook, subsequently, all the people that you are friends with are potentially seeing it. So we looked at positive and negative emotion words and text in Facebook posts. And then we looked to see whether that was moderated by how much stress the person was experiencing at baseline. So this is just an example of positive and negative uh, emotion text. So that's good, ma'am. Glad to hear that. Again, it doesn't have to have a positive emotion word. It's just that, that these words are more linked to positive emotionality. I'm all good, chilling outside, also cute. And then here's ones. You know, they don't give a, a it's a pain, too much work, man. What the hell could have told me you was there. So these are more negative. And so we basically coded all their text as positive and negative. And you get an overall lexicon score. And then if you just look descriptively, what do we see here is, uh, not surprisingly, uh, Facebook actually has more positive emotion word, uh, uh, emotion uh, sentences, both sent, which means the person posted it, or received, meaning like they, they, somebody wrote on their wall. And uh, whereas there isn't that much difference between positive and negative for uh, text, and it's a lot less kind of emotions uh, for text compared to uh, Facebook. So then when we link it to substance use, the only thing that related was negative emotion text sent. So the individuals who sent more uh, text that had negative emotion words were more likely to have substance use severity six months later than individuals who did not send negative emotion words. And, but we did see, uh, and so, uh, further we saw that moderated by the amount of stress. So individuals that were under either high or moderate stress had a significant relationship between negative emotion text sense and substance use severity, whereas those with low stress did not. So under people under high stress, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of way they communicated with their close friends actually then subsequently related to substance use severity. Yeah, Jack. Uh, for concurrent substance use severity. Concurrent, meaning? So if you look at it six months later. Yeah, we looked at it. So we could. That's one that has a causal relationship, but it could also be related. Right, so we control for baseline, okay. baseline substance use severity. Yes. Yeah. How did you measure, measure stress? So we used uh, Cohen's stress scale, so 10 item stress scale. Other questions? All right, so then lastly uh, is um, how does geographic and social context influence substance use? So we want to next look at kind of the idea of, uh, of, of our GPS data. And so there's a lot of studies that have shown that neighborhoods obviously affect uh, uh, behavior. But the idea of usually how neighborhoods are measured is they're measured statically. It's like where you live is your neighborhood. But but if we're using GPS data, we can get more dynamic assessments of, uh, of neighborhood exposures because people don't stay in the same place. They move around. So this is an example of just one person, uh, one of our participants in a day of how much they kind of moved around. This is New Haven. Uh, and how much they kind of moved around New Haven. So we can look at kind of a neighborhood effect uh, by looking at not only just where they live, but where they actually spend time. And this kind of approach is called uh, an activity space approach. Uh, and so um, what we do is we essentially, you can either do this by asking people where they hang out or looking at their GPS data and then building a map. But you essentially build a map and then from that map, you ask them a bunch of questions like, you know, where do you, you can, and usually it's a mix of qualitative and quantitative. Like you would usually ask like, okay, this is where it said you went in a typical week the most. You know, wh what is this place all about? Why do you go there? What does this place mean to you? And then you could ask specific questions about their behaviors. Where do you drink? Where do you smoke marijuana or where do you use drugs? Where do you pick up, where do you hang, who do you hang with, uh, or which of your network do you go or hang with at that, that location? 
So we can get an idea for each place, kind of what the behavioral profile is, who the people, who, what the social context is, who's living in those areas, and which places are potential risk places, places where they engage in risk behavior, which places aren't. Because what studies have shown is it's not just the place and it's not just the network, it's the combination. Right? So if I go to a bar with, with one friend, we always end up getting into trouble. But if I go with my other friend, who's not that much of a drinker, then maybe we don't get into trouble. Right? So, or if I go with my one friend who I always get in trouble to grandma's house, maybe we don't get into trouble. Right? So it's, the idea is it's this interaction of place and people. And this activity space approach allows us to kind of assess that. So by that, we can kind of then look at you know, where those potential places are. So for each place, we can then get typical kind of geographic information. So we can, what we did for each of these places is we got the uh, census data for that track. We did uh, Google mapping data to see how many uh, parks are there, how many rest, uh, how many bars are there, how many liquor stores are there, what's the poverty rate there. And we got all this census label track and then we can look to see how often they go there. And then we can do kind of uh, sophisticated analysis where we see if the, net, uh, the location level predictors predict them get, uh, engaging in risk behavior. Yeah. What bias? So what I mean is that if you're going to study this behavior in Haven, and you translate it only from the Haven residents, the, you know, the color folks, and you're ruling out the Yale kids around that age, the Yale population, which basically kind of like, there's, ice, you know, I mean, as I look at it, I can see isolated zones of Yale, and the residents have to work their way around this, this buffer. Well, yeah, so I guess I don't get the question. If you're going to ask a question about uh, drug, sex, you know, and cell phone, uh, why are we not including other population in the Haven, like the Yale population around that age? Right, so, I mean, we could, but for this, I mean, we, this, this study was a limited study, potentially, and we were looking at... Uh, we were recruiting from neighborhoods. I mean, anybody who lived, we didn't exclude anybody. We were just, we basically targeted neighborhoods with the highest rates of, uh, of SDI risk, because that was our primary thing. But anybody who lived in that neighborhood, we essentially could recruit. But right, one option would be to take broader samples of, of individuals, uh, depending on what the, what the context or, or function of your study is. There is not a limit what you can do. We did this specifically because we had a limited number of individuals and we wanted uh, individuals with, uh, from neighborhoods or areas with the highest amount of prevalence of the risk we were interested in. Um, but there wasn't, a, wasn't an exclusionary criteria on any, any criteria. Yeah. In terms of um, moving around substances, do you see any interesting pattern in phones turning off or running out of battery or like going into like geolocation dark sp dark spaces just in terms of also like like a turning it off for the sake of high usage but also as kind of predictors of risk if you're letting your phone run down to zero yeah so our gp so the biggest problem was the gps data in general actually because people would people turned off their phones to save on uh or, or Well, more to save on data charges. Okay. So when we did uh, when we did um, our uh, um, end wrap up, we asked why individuals turned off their phone. That's essentially what they said. And what they suggested is uh, you know pay for our data charges, and we're happy to turn it on. It was so it was just mostly it was just to save the uh, and, and subsequent studies we're doing that I'll mention. We're that's what we're doing. And now well, depending on your, I mean, depending on your phone, but yes, I mean, yeah. Um, so we only got actually about 25% of all the GPS possible coordinates that we could get. But the activity space approach is, is a, it, the one we did for at least this is a lo-fi, we use a lo-fi approach. 
<laughs> you can use a combine. Like, you know, you can just use the whatever GPS information they have to start building the map. But then you still ask them, is there any places here you go to usually that aren't, that aren't, aren't on here? And then they can add whatever they want to the map. So here's an example. So this is New Haven, and there were, we did find kind of clustering of risky spaces. I mean, mostly towards the center of New Haven. This is where a lot of the bars are, so this isn't necessarily surprising that the most, uh, you know, places that people deemed risky were kind of really downtown New Haven. Um, and then when we wanted to predict risky spaces, we found that uh, risky spaces were predicted by areas where there were less police stations and that there were more bars or liquor stores. And then similarly, risky networks and risky spaces, if there were this idea of both uh, the space was risky and then the people that they were with were risky related to more days of drug use and more problem alcohol use. So again, this idea of it's the combination of the people that you hang out with and the places you hang out that lead to risk behavior uh, or that relate to risk behavior. Questions? Yeah. I know like NIDA is doing similar work in their methadone maintenance program with Kenzie Preston. Yeah. Do you know about her? Yeah. <coughs> Yeah. Do you, so could you, do you, do you think maybe like constant data tra and GPS tracking might be a really good uh, way to see riskier behavior as it happens? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So of course, you know, all of this we have to, you know, again, this has to be something. I mean, the advantage of public health work over over what's being done on the Google and all these things is we can be more forthright with what we're doing. We would never do any of this if, if, if in, in a way that was potentially harmful to the individual or the person wasn't on board with. So the idea is you know, it could be valuable, particularly once we start thinking about interventions, because it, it, it does lead to what's called the precision health approach which is tailored approaches specifically for the needs of the individual and, and, and that can happen in real time, uh, that would be potentially more effective than kind of standard boxed approaches that one would give everybody the same approach. So this allows you to have like a real tailored approach based on your risk profile, depend on the places that are potential trigger places, the people who are potential trigger people, and you could do real time kind of interventions to help reduce things. And that's kind of like next step stuff. Other questions? Do I see a question in the back? All right. No? All right. So that leads to the future directions. We have uh, two studies. I don't know time wise. What time is it on? We're good. So two studies that we actually just, one we're currently working on uh, that is kind of a, 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 an offshoot of this called Movement, which is Men's Voices on, oh, actually it's Mapping Networks and Technology, uh, which actually is similar in ideas. We're doing this ideas of network assessments and uh, activity spaces. And what happens is we will, you know, similar to what I described, is we will map their face and where they go. So this is a study for young uh, gay men, uh, emerging adult gay men 18 to 29 in New Haven and also in Georgia. And um, basically what we're doing is we're recruiting them and then we're, we're, we're putting the, uh, an app on their phone that allows us to track their GPS coordinates. And, uh, and, uh, and then we're basically then we'll map that and do the activity space assessments. And then we'll do what's called context aware experience sampling. So when they go to any of these places, there's what's called the geofence, which means there's like a little, little electronic circle around and as soon as they go to that place it will trigger an assessment and then in real time they can they would answer questions about like like are there people drinking there how many people are there are you being discriminated or harassed it's like they'll give real time questions about the social and geographic context of where they're at and real time assessments of their behavior of their own drinking and and, and sexual risk and then we can look to see like how these places are affecting uh, behavior in kind of real-time assessments. 
And then the next step, of course, would be what's called context-aware experience interventions, where we could then, you know, if they go to a trigger place based on the profile that we developed, we could give a tailored intervention for that individual to reduce the, the, the trigger risk. Yeah? For your just-in-time intervention, are you Right, so uh, we, that part we haven't decided yet, but it, would, uh, we, it could either be, you know, a, you could do it randomized at the individual level, uh, uh, or you could do some kind of effect, but we haven't decided that yet. So, I'd love people's feedback, but yeah. Yes? So, earlier on you mentioned about uh, the Facebook in, uh, interventions and the particular uh, um, responses they generate, particular algorithm and, and how personnel Yeah, so I mean, the, the end goal would actually be right to work with. I mean, we have community agency partners to work with those community agencies then to to implement something that would be if 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 clients or participants within their agencies were interested in something in terms of a, a risk reduction technique, then they could download this and that that could be part of their potential strategy. So the end goal is definitely that. Right now, we're still uh, in terms of. Uh, evidence. I don't think we have the evidence for that yet, but that's what we're trying to build. But the end goal would be kind of a dissemination uh, within the context of our community agencies so that you could, uh, and uh, you know, going to our second study might be even more kind of obvious, but uh, uh, that this could then be used so you get essentially, you know, one, it allows access to, you know, individuals. It's potentially, if the individuals buy into it, um, less work for clients or participants because they don't necessarily have to come in like to weekly visits potentially. They could get information or resources when they need it at the time that they need it. So it is something that's potentially very user centric and tailored which potentially has an impact and it's something that could be implemented fairly easily and widespread because it's just simply downloading uh, 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 the program to an individual's phone. So it does have the capacity to, to uh, kind of serve the community in a way that's impactful, but we still would need enough evidence in your initial question to show that it is impactful. Does that answer your question? Well, so I mean, I think for our, for we, yeah, I think for our current studies, we're working with agencies. Uh, so I mean, I think we work, we, we work with agencies from the, the beginning to the end, always. We try to involve agencies within the context of what we're doing from the beginning. Yeah.
Yeah, I mean, we do have the, we ask always if we can recontact. So we can recontact. And then, um, a second question is, do you see anything interesting in terms of intensity and depth of internet use in relating to, in, in just use of the phone in relating to emotional or health outcomes or any of those things? Yeah, I don't think we've looked at that yet, to be quite honest. I mean, a lot of this data we have, you saw our need to look at. So I don't think we looked at, like, total amount of use yet. Uh, and uh, I think we have, like, stuff like screen time. So, uh, but I don't think we've looked at that yet. But that's, we, that's something we plan to look at. Uh, and then just quickly, we have another one study actually working with uh, Stephanie O'Malley and Donna LaPaglia at SATU, where we're looking at similar ideas as the last study. But we're looking at people in uh, alcohol rehab and looking at triggers of uh, relapse and treatment engagement for individuals who are currently in outpatient alcohol uh, and substance use rehab. And we're basically looking at what are the geographic and social triggers of relapse and treatment engagement. And so similarly, we could then develop interventions that could give if people are in areas and or with, with friends or networks that are trigger potential triggers, we could do real-time interventions to reduce kind of the, the potential uh, um, cravings that might lead to potential relapse. So this is another one that we just got funded literally like last month and that we're, uh, we're going to start up uh, soon, but the same kind of general. It's my new grant writing principle, I like, one, like one grant with like seven different contexts and submitted seven different places. Just kidding, but not really. Um, and that's that. So that's any other questions? And then future studies are going to develop the interventions. We're also playing around with physiologic triggers. So it's like if you, uh, you know, there are now wrist uh, things that measure uh, physiologic arousal, heart rate vari variability. And so you can measure if individuals have heightened variability. You can do triggered assessments or interventions. So we've been playing around with that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of different ways you can kind of use these advanced techniques to create these tailored approaches that really fit an individual within, the, it, it, within their social and geographic contents using the available technology that we have. And so that leads to my ending quote, which is, I had a cell phone since I was 14. The better my phone got, the better it enhanced my life. I don't think he means it like the way I mean it, but in the sense that we can use these phone technologies in public health better than we currently are. And we can actually use the information and data in a technological way that will enhance overall public health and decrease uh, health inequities. And that's kind of the purpose of what we're doing. And if you want more information, this is, uh, this is um, my, uh, our group's website, my email, uh, the, the SPS Twitter, or you can just like text your friends and I'll know. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, all right, that's it. Thank you.